Bible reading this morning is from Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 to 8, and then 20 to 23. I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that nobody takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humidity, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. I introduce to you Bernie Power. Bernie Power teaches at uh, Melbourne School of Theology. I first got to know Bernie, oh, 15 years ago maybe, so something like that. I, I was doing, maybe a bit less than that, but yeah. Uh, I was doing an interim at Newport Baptist and Bernie was serving as a, the church secretary there. And we got to know one another a little bit. I've enjoyed encountering him through the years. He's been very supportive of, of Sue and I and, uh, and through the years as well as we work with Wycliffe and other things. And, and it's, a, it's a joy to have him with you. Bernie teaches at Melbourne School of Theology and he teaches on Arabic and Islamics. Did teach on apologetics until recently. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm sure he's got a good word for you this morning. So let's pray for Bernie. As, as we begin this morning. Lord, thank you for your word, which is truth, your word, which is life, and we pray that as Bernie, as a vehicle of your presence, would be truth and life to us, and light and love of the grace of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, it's uh, Julian, you might want these. <laughs> great to be th with you today. It's a real privilege for me. I get to travel around and speak at different churches uh, each month. I'm somewhere, often sometimes a different place each week, and get to enjoy the worship that you have, and uh, really blessed by that, particularly by the team that you had. Thank you very much for this morning and for the great work there of just being able to worship God and use those creative skills to do that. Um, as Julian mentioned, Thank you. As Julian mentioned, I lecture at Melbourne School of Theology uh, in the Islamics Department, the Arthur Jeffrey Centre. Um, for over 20 years, my wife and I were missionaries in the Middle East and worked amongst Muslims there, and um, I continue to do that now, and I'll talk about that. As a result of that, I've written a couple of books, and uh, I brought uh, some of them along. If people are interested in learning a little bit more about Islam, this one on Jesus and Muhammad, this one on storytelling, and just some of the approaches that we use as we've been sharing the gospel with Muslim people. Got it? Yep. Okay. About 10 years ago, a group of Middle Eastern Christians approached me with some disturbing news. They said, did you know that there are Muslims who have set up some tables in the CBD in, in Melbourne and they're promoting Islam and they're spreading all kinds of lies about Jesus, about the Bible, about Christianity? And they said, we've come from Muslim countries. They won't let us do that in those countries. How come they're able to do that here? We have to stop them. And I said, well, in Australia, we value freedom of speech and freedom of expression, so we can't actually stop them, but we could put up an alternative view. 
Um, as long as they're not breaking the law, they can say what they want, but we want to put an alternative narrative out there. And let's see if this is... No, I haven't turned it on. Um, there they were. Um, and they're out there each week, a couple of different places throughout the city, uh, quite radical groups that are out there. And so we prayed, and a few weeks later we set up our own Christian tables. We located our tables right beside theirs so they wouldn't feel lonely and marginalised. And we've been doing that for the last 10 years. So each Saturday, I was out there yesterday with our team, about 20 turn up there. And our tagline, as you can see there, is Jesus loves Muslims and so do we. And we are Christians sharing Jesus, engaging with Islam. <coughs> Excuse me. Our particular focus is on Muslims, but we're happy to talk to anybody. And each week, people come up to our table with all kinds of um, uh, things. And one week, a man came up to me and he said to me, um, I don't believe in religion. And I said, oh, that's good, neither do I. I believe in Jesus. I said, but who do you believe in? And he said, oh, I'm a follower of Richard Dawkins. I said, oh, Dawkins, what does he teach? And he says, well, he says that we all evolve through the random collision of material particles that produce life in all its variety. I said, okay, so how did this world begin? He said, oh, I came from nothing. And I said, uh, and what happens to us after we die? He said, nothing, we just rot away in the ground. I said, so what's the purpose of life? What's the meaning of life? And he said, life has no meaning. I said, so why do you bother to get out of bed every morning? What keeps you going? And his answer, ast answer astounded me. He said, yes, in fact, I've realised it would be too hard to live a life with completely no meaning. So I have, and these were his actual words, I've deluded myself into believing that life has some meaning. So I'm living under a self-created delusion. I should point out, this man was an intelligent guy. He lectures in a university here in Melbourne. And then he said to me, at least I'm better off than all these people you can see walking by. They don't know that they're deluded, but at least I know. <laughs> I said, that's probably the saddest thing I've ever heard in my life. And it just reminded me of Paul's writing there in, in Colossians, uh, where he says, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. We're living in a time of, of extreme political division that's going on. We've got complete, competing ideologies from the right and from the left that are trying to force people to choose between, between them. And it's really difficult now, and as, as I've lived, I don't think a more difficult time to take a neutral view on anything. People are constantly pulling you one way or another. And people are often scared to say what they really believe for fear of being cancelled. And so the question is, how can we live as faithful Christians in such a challenging and unstable context? So it's on, on being a Christian in the face of these uh, challenging and, and different uh, competing ideologies. Well, the church in Colossae that um, Glenda read this morning, thanks Glenda, um, faced a similar situation. The congregation there was riven by two very diverse ideologies. On the one side, there was this Greek heresy of Gnosticism, which taught that some had special knowledge about what was going on. They had some kind of inside knowledge. You can see the man with his head poking out and you can see what's happening behind the scene. They claimed that they knew spiritual secrets in the spirit, uh, uh, that were mystical secrets in the spiritual world that was unseen by the rest of the congregation. They were the people with the special gnosis or knowledge. But on the other side of the congregation were, was the Jewish heresy of traditionalism, causing some to become very legalistic. They set down very strict rules of behaviour, way beyond what the, what the scriptures taught, and they were expecting others to conform to these rules. And so behind both of these groups were two ultimately competing and irreconcilable worldviews. So how was Paul going to address this divided congregation? <clears throat> he says... Take care lest there be someone who leads you away as prisoners by means of philosophy and idle fancies, following human traditions and the world's crude notions instead of following Christ. Now the sad thing is that we also see these kinds of divisions within the church. 
there are Christians who have fallen prey to similar divisions. Each week uh, in the city where we, we have our stand outside, one of our stands outside the um, State Library and another one down on Burke Street, another one on Flinders Street. And almost week, every, every week there's a public demonstration, a, 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 a crowd that moves by. One of them is the Sovereign Citizens March. Um, and Christians mar march amongst them as well. And they believe the whole world is ruled by conspiracies. Um, I met a couple of these yesterday. Just right, They set up their, um, some large posters beside our table. And for them, the enemy is big government and fake news. COVID, according to them, was a ploy created to inject people with mind-altering drugs called vaccines that they said would turn us all into obedient sheep. And they talk about chemtrails and 5G networks and other things that are, uh, governments are using to corrupt our minds and to ma manipulate our lifestyles. Climate change, they say, is a conspiracy to take away our cars um, so, um, so that the government control our movement and we'll all be like prisoners in large concentration camps. That's the ultimate plan. Physical control will be followed by mind control, and they say we need to fight while we can. And so the, the, the mindset of this community is one of fear and conspiracy. And I should point out that many of these people are good Bible-believing Christians. In fact, this couple that were there yesterday as we talked with them about Christ, they said, oh, yeah, we follow Jesus. We're, we're believers in him as well. And there, there, there's some truth. We can't deny any of this stuff about the government is involved in a lot of stuff that they should not be involved in. They've overstepped the mark in so many ways. Let's not be um, unrealistic about that. But there is also the, the verse in, that in Isaiah 8 where Isaiah says, For this is what the Lord has said to me, um, with a strong hand saying, Do not call conspiracy everything these people regard as conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. Do not live in dread. The Lord of hosts is the one you should regard as holy. Only he should be feared. Only he should be dreaded. And in effect, that's what these people have done. They've allocated too much power to the negative forces and their ideologies. And they had lost sight of God's ultimate rule in the world and his purposes for history. So that's from one end of the political spectrum. But each week in the city, um, we, we, uh, f we're not the only ones out there. On, we're on one corner of Burke and Swanson Street. On the other one is the Muslims, our friends there that we, we talk to from time to time. One day I looked across the other one, there were the Hare Krishnas out there singing and dancing, so there was Hinduism over there. And then on the fourth corner was the Socialist Alliance, the radical Marxists. Um, and I thought, this is a real marketplace I of ideas, and I'm glad as Christians we're out there in the public square and we have a voice and a presence to be able to talk about Jesus. Well, the Socialist Alliance is the most media savvy of all the groups. The, the sovereign citizens march by each week, and they have the same banners and the same slogans each week. But the socialists come up with a different cause each week, and they rally people behind them. They could be anti-coal one week and then next week save the whales and then the next one pro-refugee and then anti-tax, uh, then anti-whatever the latest Liberal pol Party policy is, pro-Aboriginal, anti-racist, anti-colonialism, uh, anti-Islam, anti-Islamophobic, not quite as strong on anti-Semitism. And they pick up whatever the latest issues that there are going around in society and they say, this is what we stand for. They're, um, besides marching, they do creative things like cut down statues or glue themselves to the road or throw food at paintings in order to get their points across. So this would be some of the approaches that they use as well as being out there on the street. And they've got a relatively simple narrative and it's this. Whatever happened in the past is bad and it needs to stop straight away. And um, so alongside their Marxism, they've, they've got another... Uh, there it is, yep, uh, another um, ideology which is called postmodernism or critical race theory. I'm going to go into a little bit of political and social theory here, um, so I hope I can make it uh, uh, simple and interesting enough for people to understand. 
in this theory at its heart divides all people on the basis of their identity. So you're not an individual, you are part of a group. And it says that all injustice is a result of oppressive structures and systems that are based on an unequal power. And they call this intersectionality. So this is a place where these identity distinctions are made. And the, the, the most important ones they've got up there, they're there in red, um, would be your race, your gender, sexual orientation. And there's a hierarchy in this. If you are white, male, straight, um, and cisgender, that means you identify with the agenda, gender you were assigned at birth, then you have the highest amount of power in your society and you must therefore be a privileged oppressor. But if you have none of these, then you are the most marginalised and oppressed person. You are an eternal victim. And they have categories in between um, and all of these hold grievances um, about those who are above them. But these aren't just sociological distinctions that you can't tell this by looking at a person. According to this worldview, each category towards the powerless end has greater moral authority. They say they have a greater ability to see the way things truly are because they've experienced discrimination and exploitation and only powerlessness occupies the high moral ground. So suffering, oppression brings true knowledge. So the majority is always bad and always wrong and the minorities are always good and always right. So this is the division that they have within the world. And I've sat and talked with these um, uh, people from this group about their beliefs. And the main way to get through um, this, the way that this is exercised is through language. Where are we up to? Yep. Um, what they call dominant discourses. And this is what they call a truth claim. It can be grounded in any kind of thing. It could be grounded in reason. It sounds a, a good idea. It could be a scientific claim. It could be a religious claim or a moral claim. And in their perspective, language doesn't just describe reality. It actually constructs it uh, and, and creates reality. Things aren't really true. You just make them true by talking about them. Power structures mask themselves behind this language of rationality and truth. So academia, for example, I'm an academic, um, they would say we're hiding behind um, our unjust structures when we talk about academic freedom. Corporations, when they talk about free enterprise, are basically using this way to oppress people. Science, when it talks about empirical objectivity, is just a way of uh, oppressing other people. And religion, with its talk of divine truth, is a tool for oppressing others. And they say all of these truth claims are just constructed narratives that are designed to dominate other people, and as such, they need to be unmasked. So reason, freedom, uh, sorry, reason, debate, and freedom of speech are totally out because they're just using these to get more airtime for these dominant narratives. And the only way to deconstruct, sorry, to reconstruct reality is to subvert these and so control the speech and so the growth of cancel culture. So when a person comes to speak who does not hold the view, you turn up at their meeting and you shout them down. And you may have seen this. I know um, speakers who have had this happen to them. They'll turn up there when they hear you're speaking, turn up and they'll just shout and scream at you because they say you have no right to speak. So... According to this, those with more privilege are blinded by their social location. They shouldn't be allowed to enter into any debate. They have no right or ability to advise the oppressed. They must simply give up their power. Now, it's an illusion to think that as an individual you can carve out any identity different or independent of others than, than your race, your ethnicity, your gender and so on. The system won't allow that. It kind of locks you in to the way that you have to be. It's a very kind of deterministic um, ideology. The only, um, uh, only identity is your group identity. The only rights are your rights as an individual. And so guilt is assigned to people on the basis not of their indiv individual actions, but on the basis of the group that they belong to and their social and their racial status. 
But at the same time, a person may choose to identify as a member of another group. You can move across these groups. Gender, for example, is not binary. It's not just male and female. It's multifaceted and fluid. And there's a whole lot of different ways that you can be um, a person of gender. And you can choose to identify um, with someone or as something or someone you want to be. The comedian John Cleese of Monty Python fame jokingly claimed that he now identifies as a Cambodian policewoman because he always wanted to be one. <laughs> so with this um, critical race theory, what it does, it divides people into a kind of a totem pole and puts them in a thing of power and non-power of oppressor and victim. And this division is something that's really um, uh, separating people. And some Christians have bought into this kind of left-wing ideology. It's out there, and if you read uh, stuff, it's, you'll often see it coming through in, in sometimes very subliminal ways. But the gospel has an answer to us, to that. For those who want to divide based on gender and race and class, God says, there is no Gentile or Jew. There's no circumcised or uncircumcised. There's no barbarian or Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and is in all. And Paul writes, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So we've, we've looked at two opposing views of the, of the left and of the right. The right um, promotes this politics of fear that's based on conspiracies, these terrible things that are happening or going to happen. The left promotes the politics of guilt that are based on your identity. And it looks like these two um, ideologies might be irreconcilable. And in, a, in essence, they are. And that's why we've got these divisions happening in society and people not listening and not talking to each other. The right looks to the future and they're fearful that the governments are going to take us there. The, the left looks to the past and they're horrified at all the atrocities and injustices. And then they want to pass the blame for that onto our current generation. Faced with similar um, divisions in the Church of Colossae, Paul says to them, don't think that Greek philosophy, that secret knowledge systems, are going to save you. They won't, because only Christ can save you. Don't look at Jewish asceticism with all its rules and regulations and think that they will save you. They cannot, because Christ has already saved you. And our advice to the modern world is the same. The conspiracy theories of the left and the historical obsessions, sorry, conspiracy theories of the right and the historical obsessions of the left will not save us. They will only bring more division. They'll try to neatly divide our world into two classes, the oppressors and the victims. On the right, the, uh, the government is using the weapons of COVID, lockdowns and fake news as our oppressor and we are the victims. For the left, the patriarchy, colonialism, capitalism, and all these others are the oppressors, and we are their victims. But as Christians, we actually see the world in quite a different way. Um, we're not subject, or, uh, or we don't submit to all of these forces. This doesn't mean we become inactive, unthinking quietists. I think we must work towards a better future and engage our society politically and ideologically, which is why we are out on the streets every, every week. We recognise that the future belongs to Jesus and he calls all people to come and join in his kingdom. On the other hand, we don't deny the past. Terrible things have happened in every society, in every culture, at every time. But we don't live in the past and we can't change the past. We live in the present. We don't need to live in the guilt of what previous generations have done. The Bible's teaching is clear. The person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. We're not responsible for the past. We're responsible for the present and how we live and make sure that the bad things in the past don't happen in our own generation. This is quite a radical shift. For us, we believe that forgiveness and reconciliation are to be found only in Jesus. 
our full our identity, our individual worth are found only in him. And the songs this morning pick those up, that he's our cornerstone, that we rely on him. We need to give Jesus our past that people are ashamed of, our future that people are fearful of, and to live for him in the present. In the meantime, we do engage the ideologies of our society. We can take great encouragement from this statement from, by Paul. He says, The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion that's raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take thought every captive to obey Christ. And Isaiah gives us this uh, beautiful promise. He says, No weapon that is fashioned against you will succeed, and you will refute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me declares the Lord. So we've just ha had a look at a quick rundown of human history and where we are in the world at the moment. We've seen these two kind of competing ideologies that are pulling us one way or another. But over top of all of this, we see the call of Christ for, for us to live in, in his world as his faithful followers, to be people of faith, to be people of courage, to be people of strength. To encourage us in that, I want us all to stand together and we'll read together um, a section from Colossians 3. So if you can please stand up. Let's read this together. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you have died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Therefore, whoops, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love which binds all of them together in perfect unity. Amen. Please be seated and we'll pray. Lord, we thank you that in Jesus we have freedom from all the rules and the regulations, the expectations, the demands of this world with its desire to push us into particular categories. Lord, we thank you that we can go into your world as people who are confident and courageous, people who are willing to take the past seriously, to look to the future with hope and to live in the present in the ways that show your love to the world. Lord, we thank you for this great privilege. In Jesus' name, amen.